The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. Whatever mankind does to the web of life, he does to himself. These are the words of the great orator, leader, sage, Chief Seattle. I was incredibly fortunate to grow up in North Seattle during the 1970s when progressive education, the civil rights movement, the environmental movement, and the human potential movement had my public teachers on fire with conveying knowledge, wisdom, and a sense of inclusion and diversity within our classrooms. I remember writing on the top of my fifth grade paper this quote from Sojourney Truth. I go home a shooting star. 40 years a slave, 40 years free, always the pure purpose of her life was to share her wisdom, her strength, and her courage, courage meaning with heart, to uplift humanity and provide greater opportunities for those who would come after her. These stories, these sages, this wisdom was woven right in with my history lessons of Lewis and Clark floating down the Columbia River and naming the Pacific Ocean. Emily Dickinson, um, Walt Whitman, all of this was braided equally together across the loom of my heart and my mind, and it was a tremendous time to grow up. I also had several public educators in my family. And so around the dinner table, we would talk a great deal about the responsibility of public education within a democracy. Democratis, meaning the common people strong, or more commonly, we think of it as power by the people. Socrates states, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. I don't know how many of you know this, but Socrates was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was the teacher of Aristotle, and Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. That's what passing the torch of knowledge and wisdom and character from one person to the next does. It sets a foundation for hundreds of years, thousands of years. Right at the beginning, of the idea of democracy, at least in Athenian Greece. Now, we know the idea and the ideal of democracy has showed up actually all over the world. Benjamin Franklin called upon the Iroquois Confederacy as well as the model of Athenian Greece to create the architecture for our constitution. But right there in our heritage, the Western heritage around democracy, Quintilian, the first public educator in Rome, stated that if all of our people are not reaching their potential, it was our responsibility as a society because we had not provided, quote, requisite care. Care is not fluffy. Care is the strong, resilient backbone of everyday life. That's Nell Noddings, one of my heroines of progressive education living right now. One of the people that cared the most about me when I was young and who was one of the most amazing teachers I could have had was an immigrant. She was dirt poor. Before she came to this country, she spoke only Norwegian. This is my grandmother at 90 years old. This is her at 90 years old. I was on the mountain with her this day in this downhill ski slope. She taught me many great lessons. You can see she taught me to ski. With skiing, there's a great lesson of lean in. Things are difficult, it's steep, the moguls are big. Lean in, you'll have more control. She also taught me, as you think, so you become. She died at 97, one of the happiest, most learned people I know. She also taught me that as we give, so we shall receive. On the mountain this day, if you can believe it, skiing with her was her extended family and a lifelong friend who, 30 years earlier, she had hosted as an international exchange student from Mexico, Alicia and Jaime, and their two children were skiing with, this, uh, with us this day on the Cascade Mountains. This was one of many international exchange students my grandmother hosted in her lifetime. At 45, she learned Spanish fluently 
in order to travel back and forth to Mexico to visit Alicia. The concept of local citizenship and global citizenship was modeled for me, both in my family and by my amazingly dedicated public educators. They cared deeply about education. They connected to my interests and my passions. They were interested in investing so that what Chief Seattle um, modeled would be true also for us now. They knew that the seventh generation would benefit from the investment we make right now. So it was interesting growing up because, dare I say, I was naive, maybe. I actually thought we the people meant we the people. I thought that diversity was our strength, and I still believe that diversity is our strength. It took me a while longer to understand some of the obstacles that we still face as a society to live up to these noble and remarkable ideals that we have been handed. This concept of democratis, the common people strong, and that it is through the many suffrage movements, first the men's suffrage movement, all men of all classes from all races and cultures, then the women's suffrage movement, all women from all classes and all races, as these different vantage points are added to the expanding we of our democracy, there is a continual evolution of how well our culture has worked. When women got the right to vote, immediately policies were changed around nutrition, around health care, around child care. Well, those were their venues at the time, and the eyes that were looking closely at those parts of society immediately translated into greater care. We're at a crossroads right now, though, because we have an apartheid of poverty going on in our nation that is threatening to rip apart this we. We've got competing ideas and ideals. Are we going to be about the good and the true and the beautiful that Plato recognized as the potential within each human being and that potential of being able to cultivate it and contribute it to the overall flame of our bright democracy. Nell Noddings, who I referred to earlier, wrote this in her 2013 book, Happiness and Education. She says, my contention is first, that we should want more from our educational efforts than an adequate academic achievement, and second, that we will not achieve even that meager success unless our children believe that they themselves are cared for and learn to care for others. I'm wondering how many of our children believe in the deepest sense that we as a society are committed to them and to their potential and to their upliftment. As an educational researcher, a cultural scholar, a certified K-12 educator, an award-winning teacher, I've been very interested in how do we address the current landscape? How do I take what my grandmother taught me and lean into these problems? How do I leave a world better than the one I found? I've studied urban poverty, and I've studied rural poverty. And I actually believe that rural poverty is the most challenging because schooling and education overlap, but they're not exactly the same thing. The moment you step outside your door, you're getting an education. When I lived in New York City, I could see that my students who were struggling from some of the poorest backgrounds, at least they had the New York Public Library. At least they had the Metropolitan Mu Museum of Art and the free day to walk through. So when I had the great honor of teaching in one of the poorest schools in this country, I learned lessons that are invaluable about teaching and about schooling culture change. I'm going to share these lessons with you today. But I also believe that these lessons about schooling culture change have a lot to say about caring for stewarding and passing the ideals of our democracy on to the next generation. So when I came in to this school where 90% of my students were on free and reduced lunch, for over a decade, the high stakes standardized test scores had been plummeting 
like a train off of a cliff. In one year, by not focusing on test scores, by focusing on care, connection, respect, and transforming the schooling culture in my classroom, the test scores in language arts, reading, and grammar stopped, and they started moving in the opposite direction. Do you know how much intention and attention and energy that takes to take something moving this way, stop it, and start moving in a different direction? So this is the model that um, I've come up with, and I love the play on words. I think that often in this culture right now, we confuse individualism, opportunity, greed with what our culture is about instead of investing richly in both our children and our greater culture. Uh, culture is a very hip thing to talk about right now. I don't know if many of you have read what happened uh, at Boeing lately, so I will claim the great and the challenging of the Pacific Northwest, but they're um, contributing the, crashing, the, the crashes of two Boeing planes to the toxic culture at Boeing. That toxic culture had huge mistrust. That toxic culture, people talked behind each, other back, e each other's backs. There was no respect for each other. So when you have that kind of culture in any organization, be it a school or a corporation, things break down. If you want to turn that around, you need to know what works in terms of creating thriving. So when I walked in to door 10 of the high school that I taught at for a year in doing my educational research, I would have taught there longer, um, but I will tell you a little bit more about that. I walked into door 10, and all of my white students were far to the right. All of my African-American students were far to the left. A few of my mixed race students were in the middle with the one courageous out gay student and a few of my Latino and Latina students. I walked into a classroom culture on that first day and there clearly was mistrust. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm gonna have to lean into this one. I spent a great deal of time that first week learning about each one of my students what they cared about, what they were passionate about, what they were committed to, what they were interested in in school. On the far right, there was Hank with his well-oiled brown cowboy boots, his perfectly faded Wranglers, his crisp white t-shirt. On the far left, there was Lonzo with his beautiful white Air Jordans, the red laces, the matching red cap. What I learned from assigning this first essay and interviewing these students is that Hank and Lonzo shared a deep passion for fishing. So, over the course of the next month, I would bring them together. I gave them a big job. I gave them responsibility. And through the shared passion and care and researching, creating a research paper, they learned all the skills of writing a great research paper. They learned grammar rules, sentence patterns. They also, at the end of this month, would give an oral presentation. So I gave them a huge responsibility, and by working together, they learned to respect each other. In fact, um, they were modeling something for the rest of the classroom that was incredibly important. These two great men, and I actually said to them, you're leaders, you've got to lead from where you are. I want to see how you do on this project. They were modeling integrity and inclusion. And uh, at the end of that month, they produced a great research paper, and then they gave a hilarious, joy-filled, articulate, inspiring, intelligent oral presentation. Hank came in with this fishing pole. Lonzo came in with this fishing pole. There were the tackle boxes. So first, we le learned some life wisdom about fishing, how to be awake, how to show up, how to listen, what time of year is it when the bluegill are eating crickets or night crawlers? Also, they were asked to connect fishing as a passion to the local environment and then to the global environment. They told us how local farming practices were influencing the lakes that they were fishing in. 
They also looked a little bit at the fishing industry on a global um, level and were shocked themselves as fishermen to find out this is one of uh, the most important issues we need to look at in terms of our oceans and overfishing and pollution and these kinds of things. Well, needless to say, they had us laughing with them. They were, uh, Hank shared how he'd caught a catfish. In a poor community, bringing home a catfish is not just for sport, that's dinner. And for the rest of the year, they sat in the middle of the classroom and told their big fishing tales, helped each other with their work. That was just one story of how that classroom was transformed from polarization through this process. So every single day when my students would walk into the classroom, I created a narrative of we. Around the very top of the classroom is what I called a gallery of greatness. You remember that picture of Chief, Chief Seattle from the very beginning? He was there. And Sojourney Truth, she was there. Thomas Edison, the Wright brothers, Frida Kahlo, Madame Curie. Around the top of this classroom was a gallery of greatness. Every single day when they came in, I wanted them to remember that their potential was as great as these human beings. The Wright brothers crashed their plane over 200 times before it flew and they changed the world. So when we change culture, the collaboration that Gardner, Gardner talks about as the magical alchemy that happens when we work together on something, we come to care about something much bigger than ourselves. And I want to tie this back to democracy. We've been given a flame. We have a huge responsibility. Right now, our poorest students in this nation receive one to $2,000 less per school year than the middle class and the richest students in this nation. If we sent our very best teachers into rural poverty with our very best school leaders, what would be the kind of transformation we could expect? Um, even though I could only control the culture in room 10, because of the transformation and the joy and the high expectations, the ripples in this school started to get noticed. Two months in, Ms. Johnson, the biology teacher, tipped her head in and went like, wow, I haven't seen this kind of joy or this kind of learning happening in this classroom for decades. People started to notice. So there's a metaphor here. I can't affect necessarily the entire culture of that school or the entire culture of this culture. But when we care deeply, we actually fuel one person at a time to care more and to take leadership. That whole remaining year, Lonzo and Hank stepped in to a new level of leadership and responsibility in that classroom. So I want to um, take a moment and have you think about how cultures are transformed. The character of a culture is created through commitment, committed alignment with its ideals. So when we have the highest ideals, we have to align our thoughts, words, and actions. The character of a person and the character of a culture are created exactly the same way. If I have high ideals for my behavior in thought, word, and action, my integrity and my character every day writes and rewrites who I am. I say I will show up, I show up. In culture, when we have high ideals, we have to back it up. And we have to choose right now, what are our, are our ideals moving forward? Are we about we the people? Is diversity our strength? Or will we choose to let this amazing heritage go out because we're not investing richly in all of our people? Thank you.